Thank you for joining me today here at rheumatoidsolutions.com on the Rheumatoid Solutions podcast. And as always, we love happy stories. And today we're going to be inspired by Paul. Now, Paul is going to share his improvements that he has successfully made by approaching his inflammatory arthritis with changes to lifestyle. We're going to learn about his dietary changes. We're going to learn about the physical uh, changes that he's made, both to get himself his improvements and also how much those improvements are now showing up. And he's going to put it in his own words in just a moment, his before and after. So, Paul, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Clint. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Now, uh, we had a short chat only, so I've saved myself from learning from you too much because I want to do it live on this conversation. Uh, tell us, just give us the TV commercial version of your before and after before we dive deep. Well, three months ago, I would say maybe March, uh, I could not, I could not l- lift my arm to turn the radio on in my car. I could not lift myself out of the bed without pain. I couldn't. I was even afraid to go to sleep because of the pain that would ensue during the night. My hands were so swollen, I could not make a fist. And I, 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 was, I was totally crippled, basically. I was, I was a cripple. And uh, I was in pain to the point where it, it even brought tears to my eyes because I really didn't know what was going on. But as you see now, um, I mean, I'm I'm back in the gym. I put on five pounds of of muscle. I feel good. The uh, I still have in the morning a little bit of stiffness, but by by nine o'clock in the morning, my hands work. They're not swollen. I'm even wearing my wedding band, which I was buying so many rings because I kept having to get bigger rings. But um, I'm wearing my 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 wedding band, and um, I'm exercising regularly with almost back to where I was before I was so ill. Wow. That's, I mean, obviously enormous. And how do you feel emotionally being able to share that? Well, of, of course, I feel, I feel great. I'm, I'm so thankful, you know, I, I'm, you know, God is just so good, you know, put me through the, the valley of the shadow of death. And I did come out on the other side. And I, I really, I really appreciate that. And I had a lot of support. You know, my wife, of course, uh, she she was very supportive. Um, uh, of course, my 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 church folk, uh, they thought I was dying <laughs> because they were able to look at me in a different way than I was looking at myself. And they they actually thought I was I was pretty much done for. That's how that's how bad I was, and that's how bad I looked. Yeah, and it happens both through the disease itself and also if we lose some weight when we try and make some dietary changes, um, you know, it seems like biologically we're hardwired to think that if someone loses weight in the Western society, they must have cancer, right? right. It, it, it really, because in a Western society, no one really loses weight unless they perceive that they have to work really hard to shed a few pounds. Yeah, um, I, when in re- yeah. when in yeah, reality, I would, I would I would tell everybody I'm trying to get to 10 percent body fat. It, that didn't work, but that's what I told them anyway. <laughs> right, right, right. To appease them, because family members just worry more about weight loss than what they do, regardless of what concoction of drugs you might be taking or the the, the friends that you keep if they were bad friends, like. Weight loss is probably the family member's most highest concern of someone. Um, so uh, let's let's go through this in detail, and then I know you've got some tips to share uh, other people who aren't yet making the progress that they strive for. And we're going to hear about your ups and downs and and the medications that you know you you were you came across, and if if any. Um, and then we're going to talk about you know Paul's guide for life. Right, if you've got autoimmune disease. So, first of all, uh, walk us through when symptoms began and where did it show up. Well, I would I would say that the symptoms began in my right shoulder. I would say three years ago, but I always chalked it up to working out with the weights or doing you know being active. Uh, so I went finally finally I went to the chiropractor and he said, well. It seems as if you have an inflammation of your teres minor, which is the little muscle behind your rotocuff. 
And he said, you got to chalk that up to, you know, the OLD disease, like he called it, the old disease. And I said, okay, fine. So I, I had him massage it and, and do what he did. But it, it started to get it started to get worse. So I went to a number of sports clinics. One tested my rotor cuff to see if it was torn. It wasn't torn. Then I, then I thought maybe because it started to get worse, it, it, it might have been frozen shoulder. So I went to the deep needling uh, institute and they did the deep needling. That's sort of like acupuncture, but it goes into the, into the muscle itself. And it's supposed to relax it. And I, it, really, it really didn't do anything, really didn't do anything. And it started to get worse and worse. So I just, just I babied it. I, I did heat compresses, cold and heat. And, and I, I just didn't think of anything. But in December, I contracted the virus, whether it was COVID or not. I was down for two weeks and I'm never down for two weeks. So maybe it was. But what that did was it triggered my autoimmune system to the point where I was absolutely destroyed. Both my shoulders were inflamed. I sat in an easy chair and slept in an easy chair for three weeks because I couldn't get into the bed. I couldn't get out of the bed. So the easy chair, you know, it comes up and you can get out. Everything hurt from my, my arms, my shoulders, my hands were swollen, my ankles, my knees, my knees were really swollen. They, they weren't as bad as as some with the with the inflammation, but they were sore, and I did I did have trouble going up and down stairs. Up was better than down. Down it was very hard. So from December to maybe uh, February, I decided let me go to the doctor. So I went to the doctor, and he looked at my hands, and he said, "I think you might have rheumatoid arthritis." And I said, "This is a kickoff from the the flu." I, I don't think I have RA. He said, well, I'm looking at your fingers and it looks like you have RA. I said, give me um, Celebrex because I was reading online and, you know, Dr. Google online, Celebrex is supposed to alleviate things. So I did Celebrex for a week and then I did ibuprofen for the next week and it didn't help at all, at all. Went back to the doctor. He said, you have RA. And I said, you know what? Maybe I should make sure it's not Lyme's disease or whatever. He swore up and down it was RA. After $650 later, I get all the tests back and everything is negative. I don't have RA, but I do have what's called, ironically, PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica, which has the same basic uh, deterioration events as, as RA. Not as chronic, but still the, the, uh, the effects could be as, as, uh, as dramatic. He said that my inflammation level, my index was so high that I needed to go immediately on prednisone. Now, just to back up a minute, he did put me on prednisone for a week, but the day after, I'll tell you, Clint, the day after it was over, it went right back to being crippled. So I knew that wasn't the answer. And I knew from your videos and your discussion, I knew that wasn't the answer either. He wanted to put me on prednisone for six months. And I said, you know, one of the side effects, so we laid it all out. I said, you know what? I, I, I'm going to find another way. And I decided, let me go, let me go to, the, to the Gobler Clinic, because a friend of ours at the church had gone to the Gobler Clinic, and she had tremendous results. So I Googled Gobler Clinic, and lo and behold, they had a video. It was, <laughs> you know, because I told you this, and, and they had a video and some, some, some guy from Australia was interviewing them. And that was you. And after I heard them and I had called them already, I had spoken to them already. But after I heard what they were saying, and then I heard what you were saying, I said, I need to check this guy out. I need to check out Clint Patterson. And I listened to your, your TED talk and I was sold, totally sold. In fact, I recognized that the to alkali your body, because I'm into that health stuff too. And I knew the alkalization is important. And over the summer, I was eating a lot of meat, you know, trying to get my protein. And, and that was just making me so acidic. It really didn't help my situation. So I followed your program to the T. I juiced and I, I'm still juicing now. And I did that from, I would say, from April till just recently. And just recently, I would say in the last month or so, 
I started to introduce other things. The one thing I, I thought helped was a Chinese herb, which the Garden of Life sells. And what? <laughs> and here's the problem. So I, I'm taking that with everything else. And now, okay, if it was great. And all of a sudden, I get an allergic reaction to the Chinese herb because it's all nightshades, and I'm allergic to nightshades. And that was a wreck. I was a wreck. But so anyway, so then I said, let me just stick with the natural stuff. So that, that's basically where I am today. And I've been able to start again with, um, I, I, I have added um, a couple of things. I'm, I'm off the dairy, totally, totally no dairy. Uh, I did add, and I asked you about this. I, I added the bean curd and some chicken, but mostly vegetables. During the time when I was totally off meat altogether, I had written to you about how do I get my protein because I was starting to get emaciated. And I did the beans, the garbanzo beans and uh, the, the, all those things. And that helped. That did help. And then some of the protein powders that you had suggested, I tried those. And they helped as well. So at this point, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not 100 percent, but but I'm well back to 90 yeah. percent. And uh, I just need to get my hands right. And um, my knees are still a little sore, but um, I'm doing really well. The only, the only other thing is, and I'm going to encourage everyone to, to exercise. Um, I use the bands, the resistance bands, and I, I look at all those videos. I do the, the, the routines. I also do the freeways. I built a gym in my barn, which I can use. But what happens when you do, and you know this, what happens when you do exercise is, Anytime you use your muscle, it does cause inflammation. So you just want to be really careful because I know if I'm doing anything heavy the next day, I'm a little sore than normal. But that's, that's where it's at. It's just to be encouraged and keep moving forward little by little. It's been six months. This is my progress after six months of research and tears and blood, sweat and tears and, and being very regimented uh, in, in my diet. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 uh, beautiful. Um, and you are gaining strength now, aren't you? You've put muscle mass back on. Uh, mm -hmm. You probably want to continue in that direction. But are you seeing slow and steady gains with your workouts? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, my gains. Are good, and I feel good. I feel better mentally. I feel better. Even if we're just mental, uh, that that's just a, a great encouragement. You know, so yes, I am seeing gains. And, um, I think I, I wrote to you, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't, I couldn't get dressed. I couldn't get dressed. I couldn't put my shirt on. I needed help to put my shirt on. Um, I, I couldn't put, I couldn't put my tie over my head when I had to make it to put my tie on. It was, it was horrible. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. Uh, the therapy that I went through with the, uh, the, uh, sports Institute, it did nothing. It did nothing. So mm -hmm. everything very slowly, the diet. The diet is, as you know, the diet is key. The diet mm -hmm. is the key. Even if you never worked out, even if you never did any kind of exercise, the diet is key. And the diet alone will get you to some great gains. Yeah. I mean, 90% recovery is sensational. So mm -hmm. um, what, why don't we explore? If, well, first of all, uh, provide some of your encouraging tips. You've mentioned the workouts. I agree with that wholeheartedly. We could go into more detail if you like, but uh, I find that. You know, over the years, I've noticed that if uh, my fingers don't feel right, that actually appropriately using my hands with uh, hanging from overhead bars or from using, um, you know, resistance weights, that it helps the fingers as well. You wouldn't think that it's related because you think, well, that's I'm actually working my chest muscles or my mm -hmm. arms. Mm -hmm. Why would my finger inflammation go away? Um, it's, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, so I'm curious to, to, to get your intuition on this. Do you think that workouts have also, uh, played a role in improving your, not just your rotator cuff issue that you had, but, uh, inflammation overall? Yeah, absolutely. Cause it gets the blood flowing, you know, in the morning I would, I'd move my hands around. I used to be a professional, um, musician and, I, I couldn't do that now. Well, maybe even now I could back there. But anything that moving the fingers in the morning, 
I would I would get up and my hands would be so swollen. I'd soak them and move them. Now, when I wake up and they're a little stiff, I'll just move them. I'll just, you know, just do this, just use stuff like that. And it just helps. It gets the blood flowing. It gets the joints uh, to get lubricated. And that's important. That's really, really important. Mm. Um, you obviously have a spiritual side and a, and, a, and you're faith-based. Uh, talk about those aspects of your life and how they've helped you get to where you are. Well, when I was at my worst, I, I wasn't doing much. I, I, I was in the, I'm a, I'm a minister. I, I was in the pulpit. I dragged myself into the pulpit. Uh, I was able to type. Uh, it was a little difficult, but I was able to type. But I, in my worst, darkest time, I, you know, I read the book of Job, of course, that's where you go when you, when you're really hurting. But I knew that, you know, in the West, I guess with, with you as well, you know, no one wants to be put through any kind of a trial. Everybody wants everything to go well. But there's so much learning when you are afflicted, uh, when you are tried, that uh, it's, it's the time when you really start to put your priorities back into perspective. And, and I think we can use our trials, whether it's physical or, or, or family issues or whatever, uh, I think we we need to take an account of the blessings. And when whenever we have, you know, we don't deserve any blessings, really. But when we do, you know, we should take be more more thankful. We should really be, uh, you know, give 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 thanks for those things. And and I realized that I was put through this so that I could help others. We have a young lady in our church who's basically got the same issue here. And I've I've. I've encouraged her to go on to your program. Um, and, and I think it really puts us back into perspective and prioritize what's really important. And all that stuff out there, it's not that important. It's family, it's health, very important. And I think that that's, so we shouldn't shun the, uh, the hardship, although it is tough. And I, I, can, I can attest to it. I, I didn't think I'd ever get better, honestly. I thought it was, I was done. Wow. Mm. Do you think that it's made you more empathetic and um, more of a uh, a person who can connect more deeply with others who are suffering within your church group and your families and friends? You know, I, I, I've been always pretty sympathetic and, and even yeah. empathetic in, in many instances, but even so now, more so uh, with the physical ailment. I think that I have... You know, it's been a learning process through through your work and through my my personal research. I think I have more tools now to offer to others in their quest to get better. And I think our toolbox, the the, the better the toolbox that we have of information and resources, I think that's something that um, we need to share with those who are hurting. And I appreciate having those tools. Mm. Um. And what about uh, some advice that you're giving the young lady who has the similar issues to you? Uh, let's say that she doesn't want to maybe go full on with the program at the moment. Um, what, what essential changes are you recommending that she should make? Yeah, a, a, a total alkaline of her body, uh, a total alkaline. And she's, she's had an issue since she was a child, but to alkali the body. Now, of course, and here's here's the other thing. This is no easy road. And we don't want to make it like this was easy. This wasn't easy. Uh, but it takes a certain psychological shift, uh, a life change. Now, I have to admit, for me, it was easier because my lifestyle was health-based. It was juicing. I had the juicer. I had the mixers. I had the, the you know, the you know, the Nutribullet, I had all the herbs. But even that was very difficult because it was, it was pretty much a total change. I couldn't eat the things that I, I wanted to eat or thought I should eat. And it was a, it was a total change. I mean, when, when I used to watch your videos, I would go, I would write everything down. I have to go buy this. I have to buy this rice cooker. I got I did all the rice cooker. And then, you know, I, I had to find place on the counter. And my wife was saying, you're, you're taking over my kitchen. And I'm like, that's right. That's right. This is important right now. This is how we have to live. And we, we made the changes. We put our mind to it. We made the changes. And I think the psychological, if you can get the psychological issues in line, 
uh, you've got 90% of the problem solved and then you just have to do it. So yeah, yeah. there's a life change. There's a life There's definitely restructuring everything and to get on a schedule, you know, juicing in the morning, maybe juicing in the evening, not eating the things that you like. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I feel sorry for your, your little girl that she'll never have ice cream, but you know what? Ice cream is no good for you anyway. And I used to love ice cream. Don't do ice cream anymore. There are alternatives. I'll make a, a smoothie out of protein drink and I'll freeze it. And I'll have that with some blueberries. And there's always an option. And, and you know, that, that, that's what I think is probably the hardest thing to give up the things that you really liked or really loved. But if you know they're not really good for you, it'll be a little easier to get rid of them. Which, which brings us back into your comment just prior to that, which it all comes back to your mind and your attitude, doesn't it? If we can get our headspace correct, then we can uh, have the discipline to eat the right way. And um, it doesn't become easy, but we win the battle. And we're always fighting these micro battles. Yeah, yeah. We want to go out to dinner with our friends, but those restaurants they want to go to aren't, con- aren't compatible. Or we want to just duck out of the house for a couple of hours to run some errands, but you're hungry and you realize that when you're out, you can't stop at McDonald's or with a, another one of the restaurants that, you know, so we have to all, we have these micro battles all the time and we have to get into a rhythm with our lifestyle so that it doesn't have friction, but we set ourselves up to, to succeed more easily, don't we? Yeah. And, and I, I'm, I'm from the Italian community and pasta is like, like a staple. I haven't had a pasta for five months and I'm not so sure I'll ever have it again, but, but um, it's not the end of the world. And you're right. Your mind will dictate your action. You can put your mind in gear. You're fine. I want to just encourage you and say, um, you know, I eat pasta all the time. We had pasta last night and you can get to that place unless you are concerned from a point of view of celiac disease. If you actually have, you know, celiac condition, if you do not, and you, even if you have a gluten sensitivity and want to eat pasta and bread and so forth, I've seen people get there. So okay. you're only what you you said you're like you're only half a year into this. Um, there's going to be a point in the future if you pers- persist and you have the progress uh, ongoing that you're witnessing that you'll be able to one day eat these foods that you want to eat that are not counterproductive that won't cause inflammation again. So. Why don't we explore a couple of strategies that I have in mind for you uh, that you might want to implement next? Are you open to that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So one, there's a particular, you know, you mentioned that you can eat beans. You said gazabo beans, I think, gazabo beans that you're eating at the moment. Now, normally when one person can eat beans, they can end up eating most of the family of beans. Normally, like, you know, the constituents of the beans mean that they're somewhat similar they overlap a lot so if mm-hmm. you can eat pinto normally you can eat black and so on mm-hmm. right if you can eat those you can normally have navy beans and so on. so this opens up an ability to vary your beans which is great for flavor and for feeling com- you know compliant and happy with your foods but also those little bit of variations in fiber that come with the variations of beans uh increases the diversity of your gut bacteria just that little bit more and so that's a positive step but it's not the big step that well, it's not the one that I'm excited to share with you the most. Um, there is a particular Indian uh, dal called urad dal, U R A D dal, and it's a black lentil. Okay. And this black lentil has the most extraordinary omega three, omega six ratio in the favor strongly of omega three, and it's very hard to find plant based foods that are so positively slanted to three to six. So. I would say given, you know, I've heard where you're up to um, and I really like you and we've communicated on email. I want to see you continue and I I want you to thrive. If I were you, given that you can already eat beans, it is likely that you will also eat lentils. I do. Um, Mm -hmm. Try, if you can find it, you might have to order it online, but see if you can find the black dal, urad dal and make that a regular meal in your routine. And I think this could be a a nice little tweak. The other thing is um, uh, something that's been working well within our support community and rheumatoid support um, is uh, is people are having success with just soaking some 
some chia seeds and eating mm. a, a little yeah, bit of chia that's, seed. That's my stuff. dessert. Yes, that's my dessert. Yeah. There you chia go. Seeds with, with, yeah, with some uh, fruit, whatever. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. So you've already got that in the mix. Yep. Yep. Uh, so keep ramping that up until you're sort of uh, able to, you know, easily have sort of four tablespoons of chia per day, mm -hmm. soak them for 15 minutes uh, beforehand. And as you say, they go great with fruit. If you take a cut open a papaya and, and scrape open all the black seeds that are in there and put the soaked chia seeds in there, oh, that's delicious. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so that's usually my dessert. You know, that that's my wife makes for me. I appreciate it. And yeah, yeah. And, and it's good. I feel I feel like I'm back to normal in my eating, but I'm not eating the things that are going to hurt me. So, pretty much uh, become uh, pretty familiar with what I can do, what I can't do, and I I don't feel as I'm missing out on anything. Yeah. Even when, yeah. even when, for for instance, like this evening, we're we're here at the at, we have a college here too. So I'm here at the college where people working and doing things. And uh, it's Wednesday night and it's pizza night. So I had I had steamed broccoli. <laughs> they had pizza with pepperoni. I didn't mind. It doesn't matter. I I don't I don't want it. I don't desire it. Um, yeah. And uh, so it's not something that I'm saying. Oh, my life is so miserable because I can't eat the things I want. That's not the way it is. Mm. We're going back to mindset now, because clearly that's an area that you have really developed some great competency around. Uh, can you give us some examples of the sort of thoughts that go through your head with regards to where you want to get to? Any kind of mantras or self beliefs that you have in your mind that circulate these hidden things that other people we can't see what they are. But but by way of example, uh, before I was diagnosed, I used to think I was the luckiest guy in the world. I, I, I said, I, I used to genuinely repeat to myself purely like uh, through amazement. I said, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And then I got diagnosed and that mantra sort of dissipated for many years. Um, and it's not something that kind of fleetingly comes in and out of my mind like it used to, but there are other sort of thought processes that we all have. What are the ones that you think these repetitious thoughts that you have that drive you and that and that 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 give you the outcomes that you're looking for. Well, well for me, the the when the first thing I was thinking of what what, do I, what can I learn from my difficulty? Okay, because there's always a learning process somewhere. Okay, and if I don't learn from this issue, from this crisis, then it's just going to repeat itself down the road, and I'm going to have to learn it all over again. So I want to learn the first time. So I, I want to learn and, you know, being thankful and, and being diligent. And of course, it drives you to look for solutions, which is good. And, and it's not only for yourself. You're, usually you're not looking for the solutions for yourself, like yourself. You didn't look for the solutions only for yourself. You might have initially looked for yourself, but then you realize, hey, I have a, I have a treasure here for others and I want to help others. Okay, so, so we're always doing something not only for ourselves, but for others, not for others. That's how we should think. Um, but I, I did want to progress incrementally. I wasn't looking for a healing overnight. That usually doesn't happen. So I put it in my mind that I was going to be patient. And I think that's the one thing human beings don't want to deal with. They don't want to be patient. Because we live in a fast-paced society, a fast food society. We are living in an internet society where you click the little mouse and you get whatever you want. And if it's a nanosecond too slow, you want to throw the computer out the window. That's the day, that's the day in which we live, right? So the one thing is patience. I'm going to be patient and I'm going to work the process. Now, just to be fair and true. There were times when you're at your wit's end, and then you have to regroup and say, well, wait a minute. I said I was going to be patient and work the thing out. And what I did, and I think what you, what you suggested was I had a journal. And I journaled every, I, I had two columns in my journal for each day. One column was what I ate and when I ate it. The second column was, in the morning, what were my pain levels for my fingers, my wrists, my shoulders, 
my knees, um, my, my ankles, whatever. And then it would go from, from one to 10. So I, I look back at that journal uh, just not too long ago. I stopped journaling because I don't have to. But I was, I was at nine some mornings. I was at nine and, and seven and eight all the day long. Mm. And, and, and then I would go and I would go back and I'm saying, look how, look how I, now I'm only a six and then a four and a three. There were days when, when it was a zero, I had no pain in, in my knee or, or in the right knee, maybe the left knee was bothering me, but so now I'm, now I'm watching and I'm able to calculate very distinctly all of my progress. And that in itself was an encouragement. And I do that with with my, my weight. I do that with, um, my, my everything. So you write things down so that you can go back, even if it's, and you make little notes. Oh, uh, today I, you know, I, I was really, I didn't sleep well. Uh, I was, I, I couldn't get out of bed very easily, uh, whatever. That will help you mentally. That will give you that, that push to go further. Let's get to a, let's get to a, let's get to a seven instead of an eight in a week and give yourself some goals. Yeah, I love it, love it, love it. I want to underline this point so much. Um, you know, Anthony Robbins has uh, has taught me years ago from watching his work that what we measure improves. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and then he goes on to say that what we measure and share improve the ex, it improves exponentially. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then we add accountability to that measurement. And I cannot emphasize this enough. As you were speaking there, I was thinking, I wonder if I can quickly pull up all my uh, gym notes. Every time I go to the gym now, it's because of lockdown situations here where I live. Um, you know, I'm using outdoor pull-up bars and stuff. I record everything. I record partial reps. I record mm-hmm. how much. Some days I have to, you know, when it's cold, I'll be, you know, using like a full track suit and everything. And sometimes because I've got all this extra clothing on, I'll add in brackets, you know, a, all the clothes that I was wearing because of the extra weight. And I know it's only maybe a partial pound of weight, but I want to get, I like that detail. And the same, like you talked about, um, you know, there's, there's books somewhere here of all of my pain journaling that you're talking about and little notes and side comments. Oh, that, that hurt more. It felt different and it moved and that one's up. And just like you said, and what we measure improves, it teaches the brain because it's on paper that that is important. And I don't know if you've done this, but sometimes, you know, I would take all of the the numbers and then chart them so I could see visually the direction of the total pain level. And and it becomes fun. It becomes, you know, you, you become, you become your own science experiment. (laughs) And and it it really is, it can be fun. I mean, it could be frustrating because you're not seeing the progress, but if you're patient, you work the system and you watch and and then you get, and then you get better. Yeah. Mate, this is a great discussion. Something I want to share with you about your fingers that could help. You know, you talk about clearing those fingers. Um, you know, what you want to do um, potentially is uh, form a fist like this and then um, actually try and open the fist against your own flesh so that, it, you know, the fingers can't open because they're locked into a fist position. And then actively try and open them. And if need be, you know, hold them back by pushing, putting a, uh, a thumb inside the fingers there. So, and then we're trying to open them. Now doing that addresses the micro tendonitis that exists at the joint at particularly the knuckle joints, because we always think that our fingers are just synovitis, just rheumatoid arthritis. But this is a limiting view of what's actually happening because at the knees and the elbows, um, where we get a a, a more of a, I guess, a, a macroscopic view of the whole scenario. There is a lot of tendonitis going on as well of the sign, as well as the joint inflammation mm-hmm. from from the uh, uh, autoimmune process. But the fingers also get tendonitis, and this took me a long time to work out because the way that I was getting rid of tendonitis in the big joints, I thought, why don't I apply similar strategies to the small joints? And the most effective way is uh, to, to build grip strength, okay, mm-hmm. so to work with a grip strengthener or to hang from bars and try and increase the length of time we can take our own body weight and so on to build fing- finger and grip strength. But the reverse is true as well. And just like a leg extension is used to build quadricep muscles and, and reduce tendonitis, 
we can do that by trying to trying to use our, uh, our uh, expand out our fingers like that. And uh, it, at first, there's tenderness there because there is tendonitis, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but I would ask you to explore this not as not as not in a way as an instructional way, but just as an experimental thing that you could add to your toolkit, like we talked about. And what I what I had to do on some of the the dumbbells was. I had to get these grips that were bigger than you could put them because my hands wouldn't close. So I yep. used the big grips for a while. Now, now I don't need the big grips. Now they're too cumbersome actually, but yeah. So I was seeing what I could do with what I had and, and what I needed to, to get to, to get to a point back to normal. So that mm. was uh, that was an experiment in itself. How are the shoulders now? Are there things that you've found you need to do for those specifically? You know, you know, um, my left shoulder is still a little tender. The right shoulders, the right shoulder is fine. It's the left shoulder still a little bit tender, depending on the movement. Mostly when it's straight up this way, when you're using it this way, that's when it hurts. Straight this way, man, not too bad. Back, not too bad. But mm. sideways this way, a little tender, mm. and even even this one a little tender as well. Mm. But that's what I'm working on. That's that. Mm. Those are the. That's why it's not 100. percent It's it's only 90. Sure. percent Well, this might sound a little a little bit of a strange statement, but but I love uh, shoulder issues, and the reason that I love shoulder issues is because normally they normally they respond really well uh, to persistent particular interventions. I'll tell you what I've found works best, and I didn't invent this stuff. Um, there's a book called, uh, gosh, I'm going to have to look this up. I'll, I'll come back to it when you speak next and I'll check the internet for this, but it is, uh, it's a book that's written by a shoulder surgeon. So, a, a osteo, a osteopedic surgeon who does rotator cuff surgeries and so on. And, um, it, he, he, he says that most of those injuries or most of those problems can be resolved through physical interventions and the one that he recommends the most is hanging from an overhead bar to to change the sh- shape of the shoulder capsule and to strengthen all of those muscles through your through your back and so uh his protocol involves strengthening the shoulders and the back muscles and and changing the position of the uh of the capsule of the shoulder through hanging from overhead bars with forward facing grip Okay, mm-hmm. not chin up, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. forward facing mm-hmm. grip. Okay, so his book, the name of that book, and that I will get, and I would recommend you buy that. It's a couple of bucks for a Kindle version of that book. It's virtually nothing. Um, and he goes through oh, the, all of the science behind it and all the results that he's had. It's quite phenomenal. Um, but also you can just skip to the exercises where you see the pictures of what to do and you can have the, have the pictures in front of you in seconds, right? Um, yeah, but put, it, that on it, the, put that on your website. Put that somewhere. Uh, somewhere, I, I'd be okay. interested in getting that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll I'll share it with you straight after this. But I'll also bring it up for people who are who are listening to this and thinking, well, tell us the name, and I just can't remember it offhand. Um, but what's worked for me because you know I've been through everything. I I I've I've had all these challenges, the the shoulder problems, amongst all the other stuff that comes with with nearly sixteen years of rheumatoid, and. And I can't emphasize enough how pull-ups and chin-ups are the solution to, to upper back issues. And this immediately seems to turn out, tune out every sort of person who thinks, well, that's way outside of my comfort zone or something I could never even attempt. Like my wife, Melissa, who's just this fabulously in shape, healthy yoga teacher. She's like, <laughs> I can't do, I can't do them. I can't, and just won't even think about it. Right. Um, but just attempting to hold your own body weight mm-hmm. is as much as what you need to begin. I have, a, with, I have a hanging bar. I'm going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> get into it, man. Get this book, Forward Facing Grip, mm-hmm. uh, fist slightly wider than shoulder width, okay, slightly wider, and then just see if you can hang. See if you can take your body weight. If you can hang, attempt to pull up your body weight. You won't be able to probably. And then each day, just try, just try, just try. And one day you'll go up an inch and then two inches 
and then three inches and you will get there. I'm talking to you. I'm not saying everyone, like looking right. at you yes, sir, sir. and yeah. I, I can see you're going to, and then you'll be I able have, to. Yeah. I have a dip. I have a dipping bar. I, I do that a little bit, but, but that no, really bothers no, me. I no, don't do like not that. do that. Do yeah, not do that. Killer. Mm. No, don't do the dip bar. What we want to do is we're going to entirely focus on back strength. I okay. Because mm. cause the dip bar is chest and triceps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We well, want to do that. Shoulders too. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I've found the book on Amazon. It's called Shoulder Pain The Solution and Prevention The Exercise That Heals the Shoulder and Relieves Back Pain. And the author is John M. Kirsch, K I R S C H. He's a medical doctor. So go and check that out if you've got shoulder pain. Get yourself an uh, an overhead bar that you can also buy online. They're about forty dollars. You put them in any regular yeah. any regular doorway of your house, and they're uh, you know cleverly designed so that they can sit in the doorway and you can and you can go through these exercises. So I'm excited for that. You know, some of the things we're brainstorming here. You know, let's get you from ninety to ninety one, then next month ninety two percent. Right, slow but surely. Yeah. Um. So. We've, we, I think it's been a really fun discussion and I uh, hope you don't mind that I've jumped in and made a few little no, suggestions great, and things. Great. You know, we're, we, we, we got to, no one's solving this for us, are they? We got to, yeah. we got we to, that, was, a, that, that, that was the best line. That was the best line from your TED talk. You know, no, no one's solving this for me. I better do it myself. I'm a smart guy. I can do this. And that's how I think. Uh, we can do it. You know, if God is God, if God's going to help us, then we can do it, whatever we need to do. And we've got the internet. It's, we don't have to go to the Library of Congress. We we have the internet. We can do the research. And then we use ourselves as our own guinea pigs and we see what works. And only we know what works. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, we're all our own little micro experiment. We all have differences, different problems, d- d- different set of challenges. And uh, we can only just try stuff. It's, as you said, it was one giant experiment. Test it, see if it works. Um, have you inspired anyone around you who've said, wow, Paul, I mean, you've really come a long way. What are you doing? Yeah, well, I, I think I think there was a, a transformation uh, uh, among the people who I know, my, my church folk, uh, from being looking like I was about to die to back uh, back to where I was, you know, pretty much my normal self, you know, back to my weight, my, 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 my natural weight. And uh, I think they, you know, they said, wow, this is great. What are you doing now? I, I, I do want to, I do want to add this. If we have a minute, we have a, we have a, um, we have a man in the church who was, um, uh, he was very into horses and he was writing for a horse magazine. He introduced um, a uh, herbs that supposedly was helping animals to cure their rheumatoid arthritis. I even tried that, <laughs> but that, it just didn't. And this is before I met you. It just didn't do it. And it was really expensive. The thing that worked was the diet. Change the diet. Fix your gut and eat alkali more than, I mean, and buy the test strips, buy those pH test strips. Test yourself, you know, every, you know, every every week or a couple of days, you know, in, in the afternoon or you know, and and see if you can chart that as well, and that'll sh- show you. Well, my body's really acidic. Maybe that's why I'm not feeling well today. And then you juice your celery and your carrot, and not your carrots. But forget the carrots. Your your cucumber and uh, maybe a little apple if, if you like me, I like a little apple in there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I remember when I was peeing on those strips, it, I, I used to buy a big, you know, contain like maybe three or four boxes of those strips. And then, uh, uh, you know, I'd be just peeing on those things all the time. So I completely understand that concept of, uh, the alkalinity and we're trying to alkalize the body. It's definitely part of the whole picture. And to the skeptics out there, we're not talking about alkalizing the blood. The blood's pH must maintain a very, very, very narrow range. And if the blood deviates even slightly outside of its its uh, designated pH range, we die, either up or down. Um, so we're talking about the fluids in the body that are not the blood, of which there are a lot. We're a lot, you know, we're 
circulating water in you know we're we're basically a skin mm, with that, water. that supports an aquatic creature yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, so yeah so let's get the alkalinity right we know that the juicing does that all the plant foods are alkaline forming almost you know nuts mm -hmm. are not um, but if we're talking about the early stages of our program and we just alkalize alkalize absolutely uh, what about do you do anything specifically targeting stress reduction have you found that that um you know we've talked about exercise which is effective i think particularly for men we like we feel better after we we push ourselves um but is there anything else that you do to target stress reduction well the one thing that was very stressful while i was ill was i wasn't able to exercise that was my mm. only release mm. um now that i'm able to exercise, do the bands. I'm feeling good about myself a little bit mm -hmm. better. And mm -hmm. that's my stress relief. Now, a lot of people do other things. Um, when, when I was really, uh, really bad and the doctor had put me on the prednisone, I went to Florida with my wife and the day we got there was the last day for my prednisone. And the next day I was miserable, but I was at a great resort, but I was still miserable because I was not feeling right. So even that wasn't a stress relief for me. It's, it's being able to be mobile, it's being able to get into the car without falling into the car because I would have to put my back against the back and fall in because I yes. couldn't get in. And then to get out, it was tough to get out because I, I have a car I would have to drive my truck and then I could just slide out. But then I couldn't get in. So I, it, either way, I was messed up. Mm -hmm. So just to be able to be functioning physically was my stress reliever. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. There's no greater stress in our lives than when the disease that has brought us the most unhappiness gets worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is the ultimate stress. And so... It's an acceleration to happiness and healing when that starts to go down because we don't only feel less physical stress, we then also have less emotional stress and energy starts to come back and suddenly it's like you're just, yeah, uh, really rapidly feeling better, quick mentally yeah. and physically. And I felt, le I felt like where, where was my masculinity? I'm like a little emaciated little girl. I felt horrible. It was, it was so bad. Uh, I didn't know what was happening. So, um, you know, after time, things got better and I'm feeling better. And now I'm on the road to recovery. And I, I have to watch myself because I know if I, if I stray off of the alkalinity diet, um, I, I'll feel it the next day. So mm. I, try, I try not to, to stray. I try to, to mm. be well. But now that you told me I can eat pasta, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm not going to eat a lot, but I'm going to give it a shot, just a little bit, uh, and uh, see what happens. Um, but, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, and like anything, what you probably want to do there is, first of all, test the tomatoes. Can you eat tomatoes, right? Well, yeah, so you actually, said that not yeah. – yeah. No, but actually, you know, interestingly enough, the stewed tom tomatoes I, ca I can yeah. eat. I think oh, the yeah. only thing I can't eat, I, I have to, I think it is, I have a threshold. Yeah, if I yeah. go over the threshold, if I have too much of the nightshade, then it kicks in. Mm -hmm. But if I have a little bit and then I, I lay off for a while, I can have a little bit more. And, but I have to be careful yep. of the threshold. Mm -hmm. Once I go over that, that's when I get sick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then therefore we have the testing one thing at a time criteria. And we also have the, uh, um, going back to one of your mantras uh, of being patient, and then mm -hmm. you know, if you can't handle too much now, then then try again in an, in another month. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, definitely on your list of goals, you should be able to add have a pasta uh, <laughs> with sauce that I can enjoy and and have a uh, regular size, not some kind of test size, but a regular size. Say by. I don't know, Christmas this year or something like oh, that. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, start with a little pasta sauce. Um, my wife makes our pasta sauce at home. She didn't in the United States. There were pasta sauces that we could buy, especially from Engine 2, which is mm -hmm. um, uh, the Esselstyn family business. Uh, but here there is no equivalent that tastes good and is oil-free. There's oh. oil-free mm -hmm. pasta sauces, but they don't taste good. They taste just a little artificial, right? So... Mm -hmm. 
Melissa makes the pasta sauce. Yes, it's uh, tomato strong, but test the tomatoes. See if you can eat them. And then when you, okay, now test a little pasta and just have a, a baby size sample and see how you go. Um, but before that, I'd be doing the dal. I'd be increasing the chia quantity to more and, and, and just maintaining feeling well for another month or two before rocking the boat too much. Too much. Yeah, um, yeah. I chatted to Dr. Brooke Goldner about this, and she she has a good phrase uh, that she uses. She said, "Look, you're feeling good, but at least let the paint dry. Yeah, you're only just starting to feel good. Like, right. let's not get." And I like that expression. So, um, the longer the period of time in which you remain feeling well, whilst eating those foods and getting stronger, you're healing on the inside. It's not yeah. that nothing's happening. So next, as, as if the process takes a long time, then that's advantageous because that period of time is a is a long healing process before we go and try and test too many things. So good. Yeah, and and honestly, I I, I really don't I really don't miss it. I mean, I, I, it's not like I'm dying for a bowl of pasta. Yeah. Um, it, but I, I I know my limitations. I don't want to be. I just want to be careful. I'd rather feel good. And lay off the pasta than to have the pasta and feel miserable because that right. just it just it's just no fun and and you all know that yeah yeah well I think we've uh, we've covered most of what I'd like to go through is there something that you'd really like to share other than what we've covered no I, I just appreciate all the information all the research uh, your podcast uh, the doctors that are on there and and we'll just keep you know pushing forward and experimenting and I'm definitely going to buy that book. By Dr. Yeah. Kirsch and uh, try that hanging tomorrow. Yeah, go for it. It's a fun thing to do too. I, you know, I just feel that we're physiologically designed to be able to to climb and to yeah. to you know we're all happy that the concept of we're fast runners and and so on. But I think we're good at climbing too, and we should reinstate that natural ability. Um, the one thing I'm a bit skeptical about is whether or not we meant to be swimming. I never really find swimming to be too easy, but. Uh, you know, I think climbing and running these things that humans are meant to have skills at from birth. Well, that was a, the swimming was the first time I recognized that I had a problem in my shoulder. The first time. And I said, well, this is this backstroking. This is odd. My shoulder's really mm. hurting. And that, mm. that was the beginning. That was years ago. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I'm not dissing on swimming, but, um, you know, I certainly find that it's not something that comes naturally. Uh, but anyway, we digress slightly. I just want to thank you again. Um, and I'm cheering you on. Uh, we're in constant contact. I appreciate you, uh, you know, your efforts that you're putting in. And uh, let's keep you on, the, on that path. And, uh, you know, maybe we chat again in a year and see where you're at and uh, see if you've got that extra uh, couple of percentage up. And who knows, maybe to 100. Very good. All right, Clint, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. God bless you. Thanks. Thanks.